Majestic she stands. A tribute to the Oakland Raider organization, an entire organization whose commitment to excellence was first pledged in 1963. Abel young John Madden became head coach in 1969 and faced the awesome challenge of maintaining the Raiders' winning ways. He met the challenge in 69 with pro football's best record, 12-1-1, one and, one, and the Western Division Championship. The Oakland Raiders emerged from the 60s with the finest three consecutive years in the history of professional football. No team was more respected, none more feared, than the team that proudly wore the silver and black. But 1970 began a new era, a new challenge. The question now, could the Raiders continue to rank with the great organizations of professional sports? Put off some brand new explosive talent. Number 87 is number one draft choice Raymond Chester, a tight end with more than a little determination. Another Raider rookie who made a splashy debut was defensive back Alvin Wyatt, number 41. He returned two punts, 63 and 72 yards. And then, of course, there was the old Raider strength, the passing combination of Daryl LaMonica to Fred Belitnikoff, which was good for two more touchdowns. The Raider challenge began in Cincinnati where the Bengals, now fully grown, seem inspired by their new stadium. Not even the wizardry of Fred Belitnikoff could tame the Bengals as Oakland lost their first opening game since 1964. But in the furnace of defeat, a star was forged, a rugged, determined rookie from Morgan State, a tight end named Raymond Chester. In Meanwhile, in San Diego, Charger coach Charlie Waller wasn't thinking as much about Miami in January as he was how to handle this year's mystery team, the Oakland Raiders. With player of the year for 1969, quarterback Daryl LaMonica and a plethora of talent at every position, the Raiders lost four of their preseason games, then lost their opening game to Cincinnati. In the first quarter, the Raiders hardly resembled the team that had lost only four games in the past three years, as they executed several out-of-character maneuvers. The Chargers, who always play well against their Northern California rivals, took immediate advantage and began unloading on Oakland runners and receivers. The Chargers have been achieving below their potential, but quarterback John Hadle, number 21, is off to a good start. And with help from Gary Garrison, number 27, and Willie Frazier, number 83, the Chargers got off to a 10-3 first half lead. Following Garrison's touchdown, the only mystery surrounding the Raiders was how to stop them. LaMonica found Warren Wells, number 81, alone as usual. And two plays later, Pete Banizak ran one yard to tie the score. Two minutes and five seconds later, LaMonica passed to Fred Belitnikoff, number 25, for another touchdown. The Raiders increased their lead to 27-13, midway in the fourth quarter, on a pass to Wells, and another one-yard plunge by Banizak. 
As exciting as the game was, the apparent Oakland laugh-in turned into another hair-raising experience for them as Hadle and the Chargers were anything but finished. He lofted a prayer that Jeff Queen, number 47, answered for a 65-yard touchdown. Then, with two minutes left, the incomparable Lance Allworth, number 19, shook loose, and Hadle was right on for a 37-yard touchdown that tied the game 27-all. Oakland had a chance to win with nine seconds left, but the field goal attempt was wide. So, with the season two weeks old, neither the Chargers nor the Raiders have won a game. And as a result, they share the cellar in the AFC West. But how long can that last? In San Diego, the Raiders appeared ready to rip off a victory. George Atkinson led the defense with two steals. And a powerful offense struck for 27 points. But the Chargers rang up 27 points of their own. Two games and still no taste of victory. In rainy Miami, Oakland bested the Dolphins in many statistical categories, but lost out on the most important one, the final score. The exciting running of number 13, Rod Sherman, and the determination of number 81, Warren Wells, were two of the few encouraging signs that showed up in Miami. The Raiders tried to move the ball any way possible, and number 81, Warren Wells, usually had a hand in the action. Wells attempted to reverse the Raiders' losing ways with a daring end-around play. His one-handed grab of a Daryl LaMonica pass gave the Raiders their only touchdown. The 20-13 Miami victory cast the Dolphins in a role they've not been used to in previous years, the role of a winner. In Miami, it was fire and rain. The Raiders started with fire as Charlie Smith scorched the soggy synthetic for a 60-yard touchdown that was washed out by a penalty. And Raider hopes were swamped as the Dolphins stepped to a 2013 win. Three games and still no taste of victory. In Oakland, the Raiders have become a physically gifted, finely tuned, well-coordinated football machine. But this year, the Raiders have had difficulty getting unwound. Oakland's hopes ride on the strong arm of Darrell LaMonica, the most valuable player in the AFL last year. LaMonica has been inconsistent this season and faced a strong challenge in the Denver Broncos. Since Lou Saban has taken over as Bronco coach, Denver has undergone a rebuilding program. The Broncos have climbed to the top in the West with talented young players like number 44, Floyd Little. The Broncos and Raiders met in Oakland, and the winless Raiders immediately displayed the form that has plummeted them to the bottom of the AFC West. Against Denver, the Raiders again appeared to be plagued by the same jinx that has made Oakland coach John Madden the most unhappy man in the league. The Broncos, on the other hand, were quick to display the talent that has propelled them to first place as number 44, Floyd Little, barreled 54 yards to a touchdown.
In the second quarter, Mike Hafner, number 84, hauled in a 28-yard shot from Pete Lisk, and it appeared the Broncos were on their way to their fourth consecutive victory. But the proud Raiders had suffered enough, and an unrelenting defense, led by number 24, Willie Brown, snuffed out the Broncos' dreams and set the stage for Oakland's rejuvenation. Darrell LaMonica, number three, shook off the losing ways and exploded for his greatest day as a professional. LaMonica completed 20 of 37 passes for 364 yards and four touchdowns. The first score went to rookie Raymond Chester, number 87. The player who was on the receiving end of three touchdowns was number 81, the man who is becoming known as Warren the Wonder. In his fifth year as a pro, Warren Wells has become the most feared long-range weapon in pro football. And paired with the bazooka-like arm of LaMonica, the Raiders' air attack is truly awesome. LaMonica is the Babe Ruth of pro football, and with Warren Wells as his partner, the Raiders can connect for the home run at any moment. With LaMonica and Wells, it is first and goal to go from anywhere on the field. The Broncos remained in the game with field goals, but a fourth quarter bomb to Wells broke Denver's back. The Raiders won their first game of the season, 35-23, and finally unleashed the blistering long-range attack that has become their trademark. For the heartbroken Broncos and Coach Lou Saban, it was back to the practice field. And for John Madden's Oakland Raiders, it appeared that it won't be long before they are back to the top of the Western Division. The Raiders finally came home to meet undefeated division leading Denver. And John Madden rallied his forces for a mission of destruction. The offensive line of Shell, Upshaw, Otto, Harvey and Spheus gave the runners room to roam and the runners moved like a relentless silver and black tide that ultimately crashed on a goal line beach. Then it was Darrell the Monica unleashing the Raiders' famed precision passing. Lamonica's arm whipped and the ball whistled. There was no derailing the Oakland Express this day as they roared by Denver 35 to 23. Victory had returned and loyal Raider fans sighed with relief. But it was a Peric victory as all pro cornerback Willie Brown was lost with a shoulder injury on this interception. Washington arrived for a Monday night national TV game, and the Jurgerson airstrike was shot down by number 47, Kent McLuhan, and number 26, Namaya Wilson, number 74, Tom Keating, 
and number 50, Dwayne Benson, dismembered the ground strike. And then came Hewitt Dixon, whose single purpose was to put a flash of silver and black into the end zone. Behind the blocking of Jim Otto and Harry Shue, Dixon was more than the Redskins could handle as he ran for 164 yards. He demolished the Skins' defense and set it up for the bomb which convinced the TV audience that the Silver and Black were back in the fight to be number one, back with a vengeance. In Oakland, the resurgent Raiders were looking for their third win in a row. Their opponents were the hapless Pittsburgh Steelers, led by number 12, Terry Bradshaw, who seems to be living in the eye of a hurricane. And last Sunday, he was swept down in the black and silver vortex time after time. But the ever undaunted Bradshaw sprinted right and arced a skyrocket to number 33, John Fuqua, who galloped in for the score, which unfortunately for Pittsburgh was nullified by a penalty. Still, the Louisiana laser punched the ball goalward. He hit Ron Shanklin near the end zone. Then he beamed one to tight end Dennis Hughes, and the Steelers were in good shape. That is until Oakland unleashed their prize rookie tight end, Raymond Chester, number 87. Chester caught three touchdown passes, as well as this one that was called back. Darrell LaMonica, number three, hit him on this one, but Darrell soon left the game with an injury. LaMonica's backup, 43-year-old George Blanda, number 16, took over and kept the ball spinning toward Chester, who is 21 years George's junior. By now, the Steelers were only spectators at the Raymond Chester show, and they watched bedazzled as Oakland's third great strike from anywhere receiver cut a swath to the end zone where he was deservedly congratulated. And lest we forget, there was always Blanda to wonderful Warren Wells, number 81, performing his usual atrocities on the opposing secondary. For the Steelers, a tough day. For the Raiders, a 31-14 victory salute in an ever tougher offense. Are you listening, Kansas City? Next, Pittsburgh. And rookie quarterback sensation Terry Bradshaw got a look at number 84, Tony Klein one of Oakland's prize rookies. Number 34, Gus Otto, shut down the corner, and Kent McLuhan shut down the end zone. LaMonica streaked one to Raymond Chester. And then 43-year-old George Blanda came off the bench and hurled thunderbolts to Chester. One was called back. One was good. And one was superb. A veteran and a rookie had wreaked havoc, begun a phenomenon, and Oakland was battling toward first place in the West. The world champion Chiefs were next, and the Raiders' offense earned an early lead.
The raid of defense led by number 55 Dan Connors and number 85 Carlton Oates struck with fury. But the talented Chiefs came back to lead 17-14 late in the last quarter. Then all that remained was part fantasy, part outrage, and totally incredible. Raider radio announcer Bill Keane described it this way. Here's the bootleg now by Dawson running to the right himself. He's got a first down. He's down to the 35, and he's brought down at the 28-yard line. Here's a flag, and here's Ben Davidson being jumped on by one of the Chiefs. Two more Chiefs come in. There's a big pile up. Davidson and Taylor are going at it. There are at least eight Chiefs. Here come all the Raiders. Holy Toledo. It's a free-for-all. It's all along this near sideline here. Stram is out. He's getting Lenny Dawson out of there. He doesn't want Dawson to get killed. After the brawl was over, the defense had to stop the Chiefs. And they did. And the phenomenon got ready to strike again. So the Raiders have the ball with 46 seconds to go. Darrell goes back to pass. A big push coming. He stands up to it. He throws it out to Smith. He takes it at the 32 and dances out of bounds at the 34 as he started up field behind Lynch. Double wing now. Back is Lamont going to pass. He looks. He throws one for Belitnikoff, a fine catch at the 50, and he's creamed at the 46-yard line of the Chiefs. And with eight seconds, George Blanda has handed the incredibly difficult job of about a 47 or 48-yard field goal. And here's your ball game. 17-14, Kansas City. LaMonica will spot at the 48. It's snapped, it's down, it's kicked. It is good! It's good! It is good! George Blanda has kicked a 48-yard field goal. And the scoreboard shows the Kansas City Chiefs 17 and the Oakland Raiders 17. Back home, the Valiant Raiders met Cleveland for the first time ever and led early. But the Browns, a perennial NFL power, came roaring back. With time running out, Cleveland led 20 to 13. Then, near disaster. La Monica was injured. Blanda came in and all that remained was part fantasy, part outrage, and totally incredible. Except to Raider fans who knew that discipline and desire was driving the men in silver and black. Politnikoff lines up as a tight end on the right. Blanda back to pass. Blanda looks. Blanda throws. Complete touchdown, Wells. Raiders score. Blanda to Wells, who dived, coming back for the pass, caught it a yard in the end zone from 14 yards out. Now the conversion. Snap, spotted, kick. Good. It's tied. It's 20-20. 44 seconds to go. Nelson under center, split backs behind him. Back he goes to pass, gets the blocking. All the time in the world, he drills one right intercepted by McClellan. McClellan at the 50. McClellan races wide to the right, knocked down by Kelly. The Raiders have two timeouts left. They have the football with 34 seconds to go. It's a 20-20 game. Blanda back to pass, here comes Jones, he's blocked. He throws to Dixon. Dixon going for the sideline, gets out of bounds on the 45-yard line of Cleveland. Seven seconds to go. They're going to try a field goal from 53 yards. The odds against this must be about 76 million to a half. Well, George did it from 48 last week with maybe three feet to spare. Left hash mark. Stabler will hold. Stabler not as experienced holding as LaMonica. Fourth down. Here it is. Snap. Spotted. It's kicked. That's got a chance. That is good. It's good. Holy Toledo. The place has gone wild. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. The Oakland Raiders, 23. The Cleveland Browns, 20. George Blanda has just been elected king of the world. In Denver, the Broncos' survival test had already arrived. Lou Saban had to find a way to halt a three-game losing skid while stopping Oakland's pair extraordinaire. Number three, Darrell LaMonica, was leading the AFC in passing. He had an ancient compatriot who was handy to have around if a game-winning field goal or a last-second relief touchdown pass was needed. Number 16, George Blanda. 
Blanda is handy and LaMonica is consistent. As always, he came out firing. As always, number 81, Warren Wells, was there when the bomb descended. As always, Oakland was on top early. LaMonica went the power route for a second Raiders score. He screamed to Hewitt Dixon, who rumbled in behind Jim Otto and Jim Harvey. Lou Saban could feel another uncomfortable Denver winter coming on as Oakland moved to a commanding 17-6 fourth quarter lead. Commanding, that is, until a pent-up Denver defense began finding LaMonica. Suddenly, with less than a quarter remaining, Denver began to control the action as number 14, Pete Lisk, came off a bootleg to spear number 83, Jim Whelan. The pendulum of play had swung towards Denver, and a worried John Madden watched the Broncos take the ball away from his Raiders and roar upfield again. Lisk took his team to the one, and then went over the top for another score. The momentum fired Broncos had forged a sudden 1917 lead with only four minutes left to victory. Denver's long suffering fans sensed sweet revenge. Oakland's old man sensed a challenge. In 21 years, George Blanda has learned it all, including how to pass while falling over his own blocker. Twenty-one years has also taught Blanda to stand tall under pressure, like the pressure of a winning touchdown pass. Blanda and Fred Bolitnikoff made it look easy. One minute and thirty seconds. Six passes and four completions. One touchdown and a 24-19 victory. All in a day's work for Oakland's old miracle man. While the Raiders remained in first place, the Broncos suffered from a record of four and one to one of four and five. From first place in their division to last, the young Broncos had found that there are many lessons to learn on the road to a championship. In Denver, Oakland followed the script perfectly, taking a quick lead. But the Broncos rallied to lead 19 to 17 so late in the game that Denver fans celebrated victory. But no one should celebrate victory over the Raiders until they hear a gunshot. The phenomenon is pride and poise. It's Blanda zeroed in on Wells. The phenomenon is class and courage. And it's Blanda hitting Bolitnikov for a score. The phenomenon is discipline and desire, and it's number 20, Jimmy Warren, shutting off Denver's last hope with his second interception of the day. The phenomenon is an Oakland rate of victory under any pressure. The San Diego charged into Oakland, intent on destroying the title dreams of the high-flying Raiders, leaders in the AFC West. Number 27, Gary Garrison, a smooth and exciting wide receiver has been one of the few consistent performers in a San Diego offense that has been off and on this year. Garrison's two touchdown receptions gave San Diego a 14-7 lead, and it appeared the Chargers' upset dream would become a reality. But the Oakland Raiders are a team known for their second-half explosiveness, and they played true to form as the trend changed in favor of Oakland. A great catch by Boletnikov that ended in a dual possession call against San Diego was just one of the frustrations the Chargers endured in the second half. The call set off one of the best performances seen in California since topless dancers arrived.
Young Charlie Smith, number 23, a third year running back from Utah, banged over for two scores, but when a San Diego field goal tied the score at 17, the stage was set for a typical Oakland finish. Number three, Darryl LaMonica, is one of the best quarterbacks in the game, but his talents have been overshadowed in recent weeks by a 43-year-old man who has become Oakland's star. LaMonica's run gave Oakland good field position with only seven seconds left in the game. And seven seconds was enough time for 21-year veteran George Blanda to climb out of his rocking chair and casually amble onto the field to win another game. Blanda's 16-yard field goal not only won the game for Oakland, 20 to 17, but it was the fifth time this season that the old man has rescued the Raiders from defeat. George Blanda says he will continue playing as long as he can walk to the bank. And for Oakland opponents, that could be a painfully long time. The Raiders came home without a defeat in their last seven games. But the Chargers went ahead as they put 17 points on the board. Oakland answered with catches by Belitnikoff that set up two Charlie Smith touchdowns and tied the score at 17. Then it was Tony Klein spinning the Charger attack to the ground. It was Dave Grayson pulling butterflies out of the air. It was Bill Lasky giving the Raiders one final chance for Darrell to drive them to victory. It was unbelievable. It was Oakland hanging from the cliff again. 17-17, they're hanging from the cliff again. The biggest play of the day ahead right now is how to get four yards or better here. What happens after that will take care of itself. Darrell drops back the pass. Here comes a big one. He looks once. He's going to run. He's being pursued by DeLong. He's at the 40. He first down at the 45. 30 yards on. He's out of Hello, Toledo. The Raiders have the first down. 18, 17, 16. The clock's still going at 13, at 12. Clock stops at seven seconds. They set it where they wanted it. And they knew. Everybody here knew exactly what they were waiting for. And here comes George Blanda onto the field. The 16-yard line, LaMonica will spot it. He waits. It's snapped. It's spotted. It's kicked. It is. Good! George Blanda has kicked the Oakland Raiders into a three-point lead. Four seconds remain to go. And this man may tie the San Francisco Bay Area up into a knot from which it may never extricate itself again. In Detroit on Thanksgiving Day, four days after the Charger game, Oakland lost a 14-point lead and the game as the playoff-bound Lions bellowed out in victory. If a Hollywood director conceived and put on film what coach John Madden and the Oakland Raiders are accomplishing for real, the movie-going public would freak. But against the Jets at Shea Stadium, it truly looked as if the Raiders had run out of miracles. The Jets, with number 32 Emerson Boozer alive and kicking, ran successfully as Boozer gulped 115 yards. But the elements and good defense combined, and the Jets led by only 3-0 at halftime. In the third quarter, New York's defense provided the spark. W.K. Hicks, number 33, intercepted a pass and slid 19 yards to the Raiders' 16. From there, Woodall threw a perfect pass to Pete Lamons, number 87, and the Jets led 10 to nothing. The 
Raiders finally scored late in the third quarter when George Blanda hit Warren Wells. But the Jets seemed destined to win. Al Atkinson made the Jets' second interception. Jim Turner kicked a field goal, and the Jets had a seemingly comfortable lead, 13 to seven. But with eight seconds left, it happened again. LaMonica's desperation he found Warren Wells in the end zone, and the Jets had been just another victim in a long line of Oakland miracle finishes. The Raiders 14, the Jets 13. In New York the following week, there was more trouble. Despite Blanda to Wells, the Jets led 13 to seven. Time was fleeting when a now healthy Willie Brown intercepted. And Oakland had only eight seconds and one chance to win. But if anyone thought Oakland could do it, the Jets should have. For it was in the historic Heidi game of 1968 that these Jets were certain winners until the Raiders exploded. In less than 20 seconds, Oakland scored twice and sealed the Jets' fate. A fate that in the 60s had doomed many opponents. For the Raiders were a team with last-second victories stashed somewhere beneath their battle-scarred silver and black helmets. It wasn't miracles, and it wasn't luck. It was instead a team poised, a team responding to challenge, ready to make and take any break. Any team is allowed one miracle, maybe two, but the Raiders defied all odds to become the winningest team in the American Football League since 1963. Now this tradition, born in the 60s, would be most severely tested as the Raiders confronted another impossible, must-win situation. The Raiders get the ball on the 32 or 33. Holy Toledo, one more shot they have. Well, this is stringing it right to the end. They may not have another one. It's 13-7 New York. Eight seconds to go. La Monica comes in. Wells is back in for Boletnikov. He's to the left. Sherman to the right. Loose quarterback coverage. They're way off. They don't want to give up the bomb. La Monica's back. He looks. He's throwing deep for Wells in traffic. It's better around. Wells catches the ball. Wells has caught the ball. Wells has caught a touchdown. And it's time. 13-13. Three New York Jets. Three of them were all over Wells. They batted them all up in the air. Wells caught it. Falling down. The I don't the believe it. One second left. This is ridiculous. This is utterly ridiculous. The Raiders had a chance to win it if Blanda can check the conversion. Spotted. Checked. It is good. The game is over and the Oakland Raiders have come out of nowhere out of absolute honor and certain defeat to defeat the New York Jets <laughs> and the final scoreboard shows the Raiders 14, the Jets 13. This is the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum. But last week for the Chiefs and the Raiders, it was the OK Corral. For it was where they met in the showdown to decide the AFC's Western champion. A highly talented Kansas City defense struck early. This interception by number 51 Jim Lynch led to a field goal by Jan Stinnerud. In the first half, it was a typical Raider Chief struggle in which battering defenses kept the point totals low. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica finally found the key in number 25, Fred Blitnikoff, who's going one on one against Kansas City's Jim Marsalis. But in the end zone, Marsalis, number 40, was as tough as Rawhide. 
And the Raiders only led at the half on two George Blanda field goals, six to three. In the second half, Oakland began to roll on the powerful legs of Marv Hubbard, number 44. The Raiders' offensive line blew open huge holes for Hubbard, and after his score, Oakland led 13 to 6. And the Oakland fans owed their happiness to some unsung offensive linemen named Shell, Upshaw, Otto, Harvey, and Shue. While the Oakland defense earned some plaudits also, the last cheers of the day were due Daryl LaMonica and Fred Belitnikoff. They finally managed to team up and beat Jim Marsalis for a touchdown. The jubilant Raiders had won the shootout 20 to six, and by doing so, they became top gun in the AFC West, and perhaps even more important, they finally played a game that didn't take a miracle to win. And now the big one, to decide who reigns supreme in pro football's toughest division. No last second heroics today. Not today. Instead, hit, control, take charge, dominate. We can't make mistakes in this game. Let's go, boys. Let's go, man. The Raiders made no mistakes. Davidson, Oates, Keating, Klein, and Dotson did not make mistakes. And when number 44, Marv Hubbard, came in, he screamed at the Chiefs, I'm coming at you. And he went at them. And when the Raiders' brain trust talked, they spoke of going right over them. And LaMonica went to Belitnikov, right over them. No miracles today, just mind and muscle, silver and black and number one in the West for a record-breaking fourth straight championship. The regular season closed with an anticlimactic loss to the 49ers. But the challenge continued. For now, the Raiders, with amazing George Blanda as their most inspirational player, would host Miami in the playoffs. It looks as though Blanda might not be needed at all when Daryl LaMonica, number three, took after San Francisco in typical Raider style. Number 87, rookie sensation Raymond Chester strolled in to give Oakland a quick lead. Then the Raider defense took to task that prolific 49er battery. John Brody to Gene Washington. San Francisco's entire season was at stake, but Brody spent most of the confused early going in close examination of the Oakland Coliseum turf. The AFC playoff looked like it would be played in dolphin weather. Before kickoff, the Sun and the 18th straight sellout crowd filled the Coliseum. But the field hadn't dried and the going was tough for both teams. It's pretty rough. It's muddy and you can't do what you want to do, you know. 
The Raiders couldn't do what they wanted to do either and were forced to go for a field goal. The Dolphins scored first and seven points could win in this mud. A determined defense dug in. Come on, keep his head. While the destroyers put Greasy to sleep, La Monica picked the Raiders up and passed them goalward. Seven to seven. But a time meant nothing, and the defense knew it. Come on, Willie! Full speed! Open up the gaps now! Come on! Put your foot in the Greasy was kept down in the mud, but the Raiders still needed more points. two-yarder to Rod Sherman, a clutch performer all season, meant victory once more for Oakland. So it would be silver and black in Baltimore in the AFC Championship.
but in Baltimore, the young general missed by inches. And then was missing from the game, leveled by a bulldozer named Bubba. The old general replaced him and the Raiders fought back. But in the end, it was John Unitas, NFL player of the decade, who hit for the big play. And then it was over. The Colts to Miami, the Raiders to Oakland. So what kind of a season was it? January 3rd, 1971. A cool, clear, sparkling day at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. The scene for a pro football game with a Super Bowl flavor. For this would be the first championship of the new American Football Conference. The first official meeting of the Baltimore Colts and the Oakland Raiders. Of rookie coach Don McCafferty and pro football's youngest coach John Matten of the old master John Unitas and conference leading Darrell DeMonica and the old man of the miracle, George Blander. This would be a day for the young to appreciate their elders. A rare day for every pro football fan to savor to the full. be a day for the old guard of the NFL to meet the old guard of the AFL on a brown and barren field of dirt. This would truly be a duel in the dust. Harry Perkins, number 27. When things got tough, Unitas went after the first down on his own and got it. But when he had driven the Colts to the Oakland Four, the Raiders finally stopped Unitas and brought about a field goal attempt by young Jim O'Brien. He'll miss this one. He can't kick this ball. Dang, kid. Rookie. Come on, rookie. Rookie. Hey. O'Brien's field goal gave Baltimore a three to nothing lead at the end of the first quarter. Despite the effectiveness of the running attack, LaMonica turned to his favorite play, the bomb. A play which almost gave him the lead, but a play for which he soon paid the price. Nowatzki into the end zone and suddenly the Colts led 10 to nothing. The oldest player in pro football, the crusty folk hero who had saved the Raiders time and again during the long season. At first, Blander moved the ball by passing to his backs, Charlie Smith and Urick Dixon. When he tried to throw to his tight end or his wide receivers, 
Vlanda had no more success than La Monica, and three of football's best receivers went the entire first half without a single completion among them, as Oakland recorded a paltry total of nine yards passing for the half. The Raiders got a break when a roughing the kicker penalty gave Blanda a shot at a 48-yard field goal. And old George's strong right leg finally put the Raiders on the scoreboard before halftime. Hey, baby! Come on, George, buddy, let's get him, baby! In the third quarter, George Blanda's first priority was to complete some passes to his tight end and his two wide receivers. All of them ranked in the AFC's top 10 for the year. Number 87, Rookie of the Year Raymond Chester, the tight end. Number 81, the speedy and elusive deep threat Warren Wells. And the other wide receiver, Fred Belitnikoff, number 25, the man of sticky fingers and many moves. A blitz by Ted Hendricks set Blanda back, but with the experience of 21 pro seasons behind him, Blanda mapped his itinerary to the end zone. First, a screen pass to Charlie Smith to slow down the rush. Next, on third and long, a crossing pattern to Warren Wells, who duped his way to a first down. Finally, a fake to the fullback, a clever move by Belitnikov, a pressure throw by Blanda, and suddenly the game was even at 10 to 10. In reviewing the play, we can see that just before the catch, Colt cornerback Charlie Stukes fell down resulting in the easy touchdown for Belitnikov. Behind great protection, Unitas again went for Hinton, who made another clutch catch for another first down. But for the third time in the game, an easy cold touchdown got away, as a perfect pass dropped directly between the hands of Roy Jefferson. Jim O'Brien was again called in to salvage the drive. The score was untied at 13 to 10, but the Colts were not satisfied. Carrying took care of the final 11 yards to the Oakland goal. By 10 points, with only one quarter to play, George Blander ran the Raiders into high gear. A draw play to Charlie Smith covered 20 yards, the longest run of the day. a fake to Smith, Blanda faded back and threw long for Warren Wells. The 37-yard play brought the Raiders to the Colt 11, where Blanda on third and long again looked for Wells. Despite the Colts' protestations, in checking the replay, we can see that Wells did have possession as he crossed the goal line. With more than 13 minutes still to play, Oakland now trailed by only three. Eleven to go, John Unitas came up with the play of the day for the Colts.
Following the crucial touchdown from two different angles, we can see how open Ray Perkins was. A wide receiver playing tight end for this one play. Perkins completely fooled cornerback Nemiah Wilson, sent in as a fifth defensive back to cover Perkins. And suddenly, the Colts had regained their 10-point lead, 27-17. After 11 years of struggle and dedication, a day of defeat curtailed the destiny of the Oakland Raiders. But nothing could blot out another year of glory. What kind of a season was it? A season that saw the silver and black maintain their lofty position as one of the finest organizations in the history of professional sport. It was a season that merits a salute to the coaches, backup men, and special team warriors like George Bueller and Pete Banerzak. Eyeshide and Stabler, Toms, Todd, Coy, Highsmith, Budness, Irons, Bowie, Weathers, McKinnon, and original Raider, Wayne Hawkins. In 1970, the Oakland Raiders thrilled our country as no other team in professional football history has ever done. They won victory upon dramatic victory and always the poise, poise above all. What kind of a season was it? If a television scriptwriter or a hack pump fiction writer tried to write the kind of finishes the Raiders have produced this year, they would send him to the loony bin before he ever got past the first proofreader. In 1963, Al Davis made the total commitment to excellence for the Raider organization. But the only real test of any great organization is how long its success can endure. The Oakland Raiders have met this test. People said it couldn't be done, say that it cannot continue. But this is the challenge, and the Oakland Raiders stand ready to meet the challenge of the seventh.